60973. Ten minutes before eight, we'll continue to assess the strength of the special relationship in a moment, but let's get an update on affairs in Afghanistan, in Kabul, from Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, who joins me now. Um, yesterday, you were able to tell us, or you wrote that they had 1,372 British nationals and their dependents, 3,866 former interpreters and others, 1,167 nationals from other countries and 226 eligible people, including British embassy staff. Uh, what are those figures updated this morning, uh, Foreign Secretary? Good morning. Good morning, Nick. So over the last 24 hours, we secured around 2,000 extra people out, which is the combination, the total of those groups. If you take it uh, since the 15th of August, we've secured safe passage of over 9,000 people. If you go back to April and the commercial flights and our message to British nationals to leave Afghanistan... Uh, the start of the Arab scheme for Afghan workers, over 11,000 people have returned to the UK. No country has done better uh, in this regard, and I think it's the most challenging and the biggest uh, safe passage airlift operation conducted in living memory. But of course, what we're focused on in the hours and days ahead is getting out the the, the residual number uh, of people that we that, that are still in Kabul or still in Afghanistan. You say hours and days. You know I'm going to press you on this, Foreign Secretary. Are we talking days? Yes, I think we're talking uh, days rather than weeks, but uh, the precise time frame will depend on how much the military planners need to get out at the end of uh, the evacuation, their personnel and their equipment. So what we'll focus, again, we've got the output because of the brilliant team we've got in Kabul, backed up by the Foreign Office's emergency response team. It's a cross-government initiative. We're going to keep maximising that output, 2,000 people in the last 24 hours. And so the days ahead will be critical and we'll get as many people out, the Brits, uh, the, the, the Afghans that worked for us. Uh, we've already got uh, uh, the Chevening Scholars coming out. We've got journalists and others, uh, female rights activists, uh, uh, scheduled to come out in the um, hours and days ahead. We're going to maximise the number we can, given the situation and subject to the situation on the ground. Everything looks clear in hindsight, but can I put it to you, we should have perhaps been looking to move more people earlier in the piece. You, you mentioned from April around 11,000, but you also said from the 15th of August, 9,000. So April until the middle of August, uh, broadly speaking, 2,000. Uh, look, it's so easy in hindsight, but we could have done a lot better, Foreign Secretary. Well, the, you're absolutely right that there's been something like 2,500 um, since April. Uh, but of course, it was only as the situation deteriorated and that came late in terms of the collapse of uh, authority in Kabul. Uh, uh, the, given that trajectory, it wasn't, if you like, a slow incremental deterioration. That's why you've seen this l last surge or the, the, a relatively late surge to the door. The point um, that, that, that I think is obvious and, and demonstrable from April is that we had the, the, the capacity and we were providing the support, consular support, the Arab scheme for Afghan workers to get people out. Um, so, but, but, but dealing with the situation on the ground has is, is, is been very challenging. We're, everyone can see that from the, their TV screens and it's even more complex um, than, than that is being able to show. Can you give my listeners a, a, a rough idea how many individuals are left hoping for evacuation? Well, as I say, we've got uh, over 11,000 out. No, sorry, um, how many are left? My apologies, in Canada. Yeah, I, 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 look, they're... they're um, it's difficult to gauge the numbers because it's not just those that are left, but it's those that actually want to come out. So just to give you a sense, we've we've uh, secured the return of around 2,500 British nationals, including their dependents. Almost all of the mono-British nationals, that's just straight British nationals with uh, documentation, um, have now returned, almost all. So we're left with the very complex cases, which sometimes means large family units uh, of whom some are nationals, some aren't, some are documented, some aren't. So it's working through those and uh, we'll get through as many of those cases uh, and make sure that those that are eligible can come back um, in the way that we have done, as I said, since April. Um, looking at events yesterday in the G7 summit, is the special relationship over, Foreign Secretary? No, of course it isn't. It um, matters uh, a huge well, amount. You, you say, of course it isn't. It wasn't particularly forthcoming or fruitful conversations between the Prime Minister and the President Biden, was it? Well, I think the Prime Minister was right to convene the G7 as a whole. I think a lot of countries wanted to test, can we have some more days? It's very clear 
from the the that the, the we'll now be working to the end of August. We're going to have to work with that reality. But I think also, as well as safe passage, it was right that the PM got the major economies, the major countries together to not just talk about the safe passage, but counterterrorism, the humanitarian situation, what we're going to do to uh, exercise moderating influence on human rights. And of course, um, the Taliban is saying, and overnight their spokesperson says that they want to avoid the brain drain from Afghanistan. Um, and the only way they'll be able to achieve that is by uh, exercising a more, uh, a, a less malign and more inclusive approach than the previous Taliban regime. And we've got to exercise every lever we've got at our disposal to try and exercise maximum moderating influence. You've got to do that with a broader caucus of countries. And that's why ah. the PM got the G7 together. But and I'm sure he tried very hard, but isn't this a role for the United Nations, Foreign Secretary? Yeah, absolutely. They will have a role, which is so at the G7 meeting, the UN Secretary General was there. I spoke to, in the last 24 hours, Jean Arnaud, the Afghan special envoy from, from the Secretary General. What we want to try and achieve is not just G7 uh, approach. We want to bring in the permanent members of the Security Council. That includes China, who I've spoken to my opposite number, in, will include Russia. We also need to bring in the regional partners, uh, Pakistan, India. Uh, I've spoken to both of those foreign ministers. And the UN will have an important coordinating role, but also a role in relation to the humanitarian effort, which will require the Taliban to allow a permissive environment, if I could put it that way, because uh, Western countries and donor countries will not give directly to the Taliban. They'll want to give uh, uh, via hu human rights, uh, uh, sorry, humanitarian agencies and UN agencies that are on the ground. If that's going to happen, the Taliban will have to do some things too. OK. Um, is it true now that the Taliban are preventing Afghan nationals from trying to get to Kabul airport? We've seen pitted examples of this um, right in recent weeks. And uh, the, the Taliban are saying that they, on the one hand, they don't want their talented people to leave. And I think that the, uh, what's happening on the ground reflects that. Equally, they've given us assurances about getting out our nationals, but also the people that, that work for us um, and, and other groups. So we will hold them to those assurances. And I think it's a critically important test. If the Taliban wants to avoid a collapse of their economic, their social system, they're going to need to engage constructively uh, with the international community and the UK, the US and, and many others. So this will be an important test for them. And whether the, 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 this iteration of the Taliban is uh, less malign and and capable of being more inclusive than the previous one. Uh, notwithstanding the message in your article in, yesterday, in yesterday's Daily Telegraph, candidly, Foreign Secretary, this is what defeat looks like, isn't it? Look, we, we, no one is saying that we wanted to be in this situation. Well, the but truth this is, is how defeat, you deal with... isn't it? When, when we can really only to... operate with the uh, compliance of the Taliban, this is a defeat. Look, we deal with the reality. The, I think the answer well, to that question... Can I put it to you again, the reality? It is a defeat, isn't it? Well, it depends. It depends. If the Taliban, given the levers we have at our disposal, the international financial institutions that they want to access, the ODA, the avoiding further sanctions, uh, if they want to engage uh, in a more... Uh, inclusive way. They're going to have to bring in other factions of uh, Afghan political representation. There is therefore the possibility of a more positive, more constructive regime. Um, but look, but we're, we're uh, not happy about the situation and concerned about the situation, but we deal with the reality as we see it. And our priorities are counterterrorism, safe passage of our nationals and those that work for us, and trying to avoid a devastating humanitarian crisis which looms. And it looms for the Taliban, which I don't think wants to inherit that, and would have an impact on regional stability as well. Can you just take briefly take you back to some figures you quoted us earlier? You said that no country has done better than the United Kingdom, 11,000 repatriated. We have double-checked this figure. The United States have got 70,000 people out, so clearly they've done better. Have you got well, I mean, propor but proportionately to um, the nationals and uh, the size of our country, I don't think uh, in the time frame but uh, any country We're dealing with people on the ground in Afghanistan, aren't we? We're not dealing with a chunk of the United States population. It's what you are presented with. So for you to say we've done better than any other nation, 11,000 plays the United States, 70,000 is palpably wrong, as a proportion isn't it? Of, as a proportion of the nationals and the workers that they have in country. So there are seven times the number of Americans are there. 
I, look, I, I don't think if you look at the number and the quality and the range of people that any country has done better. But look, we, we, it's a team effort. We're working with the United States, with the other countries. Um, and I think we should be, uh, of course, uh, surging every sinew and an effort to get uh, everyone out uh, by, uh, or as many people out by the, the deadline okay. we've got. But the fact that we've secured the safe passage of 11,000 people out is a significant achievement. I don't think it's been done uh, before, and certainly not in living memory of the UK. Just the last UK. couple of things. It's reported that the Prime Minister is thinking that billions of pounds of frozen Afghan assets could be unfrozen if the Taliban were to grant more time to allow people to leave the country. Would you support that? Of course, the PM and I are very clear. Uh, if the Taliban want access to the international financial uh, institutions and the and the resources that will be uh, enable them to avoid the collapse of institutions, the economy, they will have to do a range of things too. Safe passage is the top priority, but it's not the only one. They'll need to give uh, clear, credible, verifiable assurances that uh, that they're, they're they're clamping down on the on the risk of terrorist uh, attacks from outside of Afghanistan. There are other things around. Uh, the way they treat women. But that gives you an example of the one of the levers that we've got, such as they are. So, so you would support that, the unfreezing, <clears throat> just to be specific? I, I support the use of all the tools and all the levers we've got, including access to financial institutions, uh, and, and that will be a multilateral decision, uh, okay. the, the, the scope for further sanctions, and indeed uh, the, the being clear on the assurances in order to provide any aid would never be done to the Taliban, but via third-party groups like the UN, like uh, NGOs. They will have to step up to the plate and provide assurances uh, and uh, demonstrate through their conduct uh, that they can live by those assurances if they want to access those kind of uh, funds and avoid the collapse of the situation um, in Afghanistan. A couple of other matters, reminding, of course, the listeners your role in Brexit. We're waking up to headlines today that retail crisis stocks are at their lowest level since 1983. Is this as a result of the Brexit that you helped deliver? Well, I think there's been an issue reported, I think you're referring to the HGVs and the question of whether uh, produce can get through to the stores. This We're is the Confederation of British Industry saying stock levels in relation to expected sales are at their lowest level in August since tracking began in 1983. And I think the reason Many are that saying they attribute it's the Brexit that you helped deliver. And I think they're attributing it to the availability of staff for HGVs. And what we're doing is streamlining the process uh, to get more UK uh, and, and other people uh, being able to man those HGVs. Um, I would point, uh, of course, to the huge opportunities that we talked about in relation to Brexit, the, the growing number of free trade deals that we've not just done, uh, concluded, but, but are seeking to conclude, including the Trans-Pacific, um, the, the, the CPTPP, uh, Trans-Pacific free trade deal, which will create enormous trading opportunities, and Liz Truss is working uh, shoulder to the wheel on all of those. So we'll deal with the HGV situation. I think we've got uh, uh, the, the Department of Transport have got a good grip on that, and um, we'll manage those challenges, but we're also ready to grasp the enormous opportunities, and I think the Trade Secretary has done a great job on all of that, and the Foreign Office is backing her up all the way. All right, lastly, it was reported on the weekend that it was requested you came back from that holiday, now that infamous holiday on Friday, but you did not return until the early hours of Monday morning. Is that true? I don't know. That's not true. I'm not going to get drawn on all of that. I answered those questions over the weekend. Our focus as a government mine was on making sure we secured the airport and the capacity to get as many people back as possible. And we got over 9,000 people back. And I think that shows you that uh, in the Foreign Office, myself and across government, we were on the job. All right. And lastly, has anyone spoken to Paul or Penn Farthing? He's the former Marine who's running an animal uh, charity in Afghanistan. He's trying to get a number of his colleagues out. There had been exchanges between the, uh, him and uh, your former, your colleague, I'm sorry, your colleague, uh, Ben Wallace. Have we picked up those communications again? Has someone spoken to the Marine? Well, there, there's uh, engagement with uh, his charity. Uh, we're trying to do all we can for the staff, but I, I, in terms of the animals and uh, the question of whether they can be prioritised ahead of uh, the other people that are trying to get out, I don't have anything more to add to what the Defence Secretary, I think, rightly said um, uh, over the last 24 hours. Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, thank you for your time appearing here on LBC when four minutes after eight news is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, Joe Biden says the sooner American troops can leave Afghanistan, the better because of the increased...